I want to kind of reemphasize this morning, if I can, about what the study is about. Um, it's about looking at the scripture as a whole. And I want to just draw a little diagram up here. This, this won't really mean much to you, but I want to just sort of do it this way if I can. Is that, let's just say that this right here, I'm just going to say that this right here represents the Bible. But inside the Bible, there are all kinds of events and people and things that have happened. There's the, there's the cross, you know, there is the Red Sea, um, there's Jonah and the whale, there's all kinds of things, there's the second coming. There are all kinds of events that have taken place in the Bible. And one of the problems is that if you study the Bible, if you just look up here for a minute and you just concentrate on one event, there's a good chance that you will not necessarily be able to see how it fits. I think there are a lot of people that have gone through a study of Scripture. Uh, maybe they even did a survey all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. I know there's some pastors that have done that. But still, what happens is that they don't really know how all of that fits into the whole. So everything that we're going to do in this study is related to the whole. I'm not going to spend time, we're not going to talk about Jonah and the whale. Um, we may mention the Red Sea somewhere, but that's really not that's really not the purpose of this study, is to get into the detail. It's to see the big picture. And one of the ways that I think about this, and one of the ways that I want to address it, is that there are different ways to see things. I, I would, if you were taking notes, I would write this down. I would write that perspective is everything. My perspective is everything. If I'm flying up in a plane and I'm at 38,000 feet, everything looks big. I mean, looks a, a tiny. Um, I, you know, I've always remembered the times that I would fly to Chicago and I'd fly over the Mississippi River and it looked just like a little, you know, but in some places it's a mile wide and you can come down and there are times that you can you can see cars, but you don't, you can't tell what kind of car it is. You wouldn't know if it was a Ford or a Chevrolet or a Tesla or whatever it was, if it was a truck or whatever. You may be able to tell the difference between an 18-wheeler and, and a, a car. But for the most part, at 38,000 feet, and that's where we're going to stay, all right? We're going to stay up at the 38,000-foot level. Down at my level, down at eyesight level, I can get in my car and I can see things that I cannot see at 38,000 feet, right? I could tell it's a F-150 or if it's a Honda or if it's a Mazda or whatever it may be. Uh, I can tell that. I can tell uh, the name on a store, blah, blah, blah. Or I could take a microscope right and I could look at something under a microscope and it looks completely different than it does if I'm just looking at it individually you can see and so perspective really kind of dictates what you see and if, if and if I can say it this way perspective dictates how you think in a lot of cases um, I was, uh, Brenda and I were talking about it at breakfast, and I was asking her, I said, sweetheart, can you remember any times in your life where something happened and you had a certain perspective on it and you thought about it a certain way, and then something else happened, there was some more information that somebody gave you, and... Uh, and all of a sudden, your perspective on it completely changed. In fact, you, it may be a 180 degree change that you experienced in your life because of 
the additional information that you actually had about what had taken place. And we were just trying to think, I'm, I'm sure that's happened to all of us. I know it's happened to me. You know, you go, oh, why didn't I see that or, or whatever. But I think for me that the greatest example of that in my life is the day that I got saved. Before I got saved, I looked at life in a certain way. I had kind of a certain worldview, if I can call it that, where I, you know, I, I think if you would ask me if I believed in God, I would say yes, but I, I, I had never really trusted God for my salvation. And uh, I didn't care about going to church. I didn't care about reading the Bible. I'd grown up in a church. It kind of bored me uh, at times. And I, I, you know, I was just as lost as a goose in a snowstorm and then somebody shared the gospel and and I got saved and everything that I used to think was bad uncomfortable something that I really didn't want to be committed to something that I thought was uh, restrictive and judgmental and blah 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 all those kind of words all of a sudden it was exactly the opposite. I wanted to go to church every time the doors opened. I wanted, I wanted to read my Bible every day. I couldn't put it down. I, I wanted to be with other believers. I, I used to be, remember last week I was telling you when the Bob Jones students came to, and I didn't want to have anything to do with them. I mean, I didn't, I, I wish I'd had something to do with them earlier. It saved me a lot of grief, but I didn't. But something happened in my life that gave me a different perspective than I had actually, than I had actually had before. And now I had, if I can say it this way, if I look up here, I, I had a completely different perspective. I would call it, I'm, I'm going to just use this word here, uh, I had a complete paradigm shift. I was telling uh, Chris the other day, we were talking about this, and I told him, I said, I, I think that the way that I understand the scriptures is that the greatest changes that happen in a person's life is when they have a paradigm shift. I can change one thing in my life. I'm working on, if I'm interrupted to stop or if I, I didn't, you know, not complaining and murmuring about the lady at Walmart in front of me and all that kind of stuff. And, but those are kind of small things. They Im impact me. Uh, they help me in my life. But the really big changes is when I have a paradigm shift. Where I saw something in one way and now I see it in a completely different light, in a completely different way. It may be um, um, it, it, it may be somebody that you know uh, you didn't like them and now you like them. Something happened. Uh, it could be uh, your boss at work. I had a I had a professor in school. His name was uh, Peter Lee, and he was the best professor that I ever had ever. In anywhere, uh, he was in. He was my one of my architectural professors that would grade our, that would go into labs with us and help us when we were doing the design. And he would come in and he would mark up everything. And it'd be the day before the stinking presentation, and he would come in there and he had. Uh, uh, what is it when you shake a Parkinson's? He had Parkinson's. So have you ever seen anybody with Parkinson's try to work on a finished product and he's drawing a line and it looks like, I mean, I mean, it looks like that. And that's exactly what would happen. And he would come in and I'm going, Mr. Lee, Peter Lee, why in the world are you messing this up? I've got to start again. I can't, I can't turn this in like that. You knew this. I've got to stay up all night long. 
I've got a test in advanced calculus tomorrow. What in the world are you doing? But he was the best professor I ever had. And I didn't see that until I left school. He challenged me. He encouraged me. He helped me to be a good designer in a way that nobody ever did. Nobody else ever did. And to this day, he was lost as he could be. To this day, I'm really, really grateful for him. I used to see him one way. I, you know, it's like when I would see him coming in the lab. I had a lab every day. It was from 1 to 5. Before I left, every day, nobody had anything like that. And I'd see him coming, and I'd go to the bathroom. I mean, I, I, had, I had to go get a drink of water or something. Because I knew what he was going to do. And it didn't matter where I was in the design, this is what I was going to get when it was over. And I just, I didn't want to see him. Later on, I had a paradigm shift. That really, he really helped me. So, and I think this is a very critical thing for our study, is that what we are going to do, I'm just going to call, let me just see if I can write it up here like this. I'm just going to say all these little things that I've got here. That these are the details. Can you all see that back there? Is it too small? These are all the details. All of this stuff here. They're, they're the details. They're, they're just stories, they're narratives, they're doctrines, they're principles, and all of that. And in this study, we have got to see more than the details. So I'm not going to talk about the details that much. We're going to look at the big picture. I, there, I, I don't want you to under, uh, misunderstand me. There's, there's a lot of knowledge in the details. There's purpose in the details. There's purposes behind the story of Jonah and the whale, whatever it may be. They're all there. But in the big picture, in the big picture, they are not the issue. The issue is the whole. It's the big picture. It's what you see in, without the details. And if I spend too much time addressing the details, I'll miss what? The big picture. I'll miss the big picture. So I want you to see the big picture in all of this. Here's what I'm trying to say. The details are greatly important. They're important. You can't leave them out of the narrative. You just can't do it. But they have a much greater importance when they are connected to the whole. When you see the whole and you see how they actually are connected to the whole, then they make more sense to you, right? So the more of the big picture that I can give you, the more of this thing right here that I can give to you, the more sense Jonah's going to make. Now, I want to give you an example. Everybody, why don't you turn in Mark chapter 2. I'm, I'm not going to read all this, but you can just have it right there in front of you because you know what happened. This is a story about Jesus when they lowered the guy down through the roof. Everybody know that story? They, he was inside and he was teaching and they, they, couldn't, they couldn't get this guy in. So what they did is that they went up onto the roof and they kind of cut a hole in the roof. I don't know how they did that. And then they lowered this guy down so that he came right there in front of Jesus. And you know what happened, how, how it worked. Uh, uh, if you just lifted this story, if you just took this story out of its context, Let's just say that you went somewhere and you didn't know anything about the Bible and somebody just read this story to you. 
maybe you were having lunch, and he says, I want to read this story to you and see what you think. And so they read the story to you, and it's about a man that was crippled, and they got a hole in the roof, and they lured him down, and they gave him to Jesus. And this guy didn't even know who Jesus is. And they, and they, when Jesus heals them, and then the story ends. Well, what's happened is that you've lifted it out of its context. So you don't know what it means. And I'm not just talking about the immediate context, I'm talking about the whole context of the New Testament, of the Old Testament, everything that God is wanting to do. So let's just see if we can see it from a different way. You know, it, 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 it might be a nice story, but you would never understand if I wrote up here, if I wrote down something about, I just took this little event out and this is the, I'm just gonna say roof, all right? So that this man got lowered down through the roof and you're kind of going, okay. Okay, what does all that mean? Uh, and, and I mean, this Jesus thing, what does all that mean? Now, here's what I want you to understand. Everybody listen carefully. Before Jesus healed the man, what did he do? Somebody tell me. Say it out loud. He forgave him of his sins. I mean, if you go there and you read it, verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic sons, your sins are forgiven. Now, I have to, if you had been there, if you had been a Pharisee and you had been in that, in that room when they dropped him down and he said, hey, your sins are forgiven, everybody there went into absolute shock, right? Right? Everybody said, right. <laughs> Everybody went into shock. They, they were staggered that, what are you talking about? You're just some lowly carpenter. You don't even have a home. You, you don't have anything except what's on your back. You have no education. What, who are you to say that you can forgive sins? So then Jesus asked this really, really important question. What was the question? Somebody tell me. Which is easier to forgive? That's right. Now that's a rhetorical question, right? Okay, guys. Is it easier to forgive somebody of sins or to say, take up your bed and walk? Well, I could say your sins are forgiven, but that doesn't mean anything, right? But if you had a dead man sitting there and you raised him from the dead, if you had somebody that was crippled or somebody that was blind and you said, take up your bed and walk, and the guy jumps up and leaps and runs out, what you said about sins would have a different significance to it. And that was what was happening in this story. God was validating through the miracle that he had the power to forgive sins, and the only person that could do that was God. I can't forgive anybody's sins. I, I can't. I mean, well, I mean, who am I? And that was the way that they thought about Jesus. And he said, hey, your sins are forgiven, and oh, just to prove that I can forgive your sins, take up your bed and walk. And he was validating that he was who he said he was, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the God-man. <clears throat> That's what he was doing. He was validating who he was. And so, that's the big picture, right? Right? If all you see is this guy being lowered down through the roof and him being healed, you miss the whole point of the story. There's a bigger context of what was going on. So here's what happens. Everybody listen carefully. I'll write this down if you take notes. The big picture 
makes all of the details of Scripture more important. The big picture of Scripture makes all of the details of Scripture more important. I'm not a mechanic. You don't want me to change the oil on your car, on your lawnmower, on anything. I am mechanically, what's the right word? Somebody knows me, tell me. I am me. Huh? I am mechanically disabled. That comes from my granddaughter that knows me very well. You don't want me working on mechanical things at all. I've tried, but I'm not any I'm not any good at it. So, but let's just say that if you had an engine, we got all kinds of engines, right? We got engines for chainsaws, we got engines for uh, uh, generators, we got engines for everything on the planet. Engine for a tractor, engine for a car. If I brought an engine and just just put it right here in the middle of the floor for a, an automobile, it doesn't make much sense by itself, right? I don't know what it's for. I mean, I, you know, I could guess. But when I put it in a car, when it gets in the hole and you crank it up and you drive off, it makes a lot of sense, right? by itself, left alone to itself, it doesn't have the same impact. So the greater that, the, the, the more that we know what the big picture is, the more important the details become to us. <clears throat> I'd go so far to say that the details don't really have too much meaning apart from the whole. Let's just say, if, let's just say, if everybody just, uh, just look up here for a minute. Let's just say that God had no intention of saving us. None. We're just, he's a, we're just a big clock. He wound it up and says, all right, just let everything run and we'll, we'll, it'll, it'll, it'll stop running someday. He had no intention of forgiving us of our sins. He had no intention of actually saving us. Uh, there is no salvation. There is no heaven. There is no hell, there, there's none of that, then who cares about the details? Right? Who cares about the details? This is some kind of story. They have no significance whatsoever, so what am I saying? Now you're going to think that I'm, I'm jumping ship here, but I'm not. All right, I'll bring it back into perspective. What am I really trying to say? Here's what I'm trying to say for our benefit. Is that when, if I were to ask you to define Christianity, I wonder what you would say to me. I wonder what kind of answer you would give to me. You know, if I gave you a piece of paper, I said, just write down a piece of paper to define Christianity. But here's what I think. I think when we begin to try and define Christianity, you're going to think that I'm, this is blasphemy, so just forgive me. <laughs> Bear with me. I'll get through it. You don't start with Jesus saves. If you're going out to witness to somebody and you're going to share the gospel with them, I'm not telling you that you can't do that. But if you're going to somebody that doesn't know anything about the gospel, or about the Bible, and there are plenty of people like that out there that have been raised in families, they don't go to church, they don't really care about going to church, they got their own ideas, they, they, they got their own culture, they got their little pack that they run in, run in and they've got their ideas, you, you know, somebody in a gang. They, they, they have their own code, right? And that's what they believe, and if I just say Jesus saves and you need to be saved, they just turn you off immediately. Francis Schaeffer, who's a wonderful theologian, he said it this way. He says, Christianity does not start with Jesus saves you from your sins. Everybody listen. It starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
Christianity begins with God. It begins with what God has done. That's the big picture. So what Schaefer was saying is that if we start with just Jesus saves, it's sort of, I, I just, I, I'm just reading constantly. I'm reading books every day. It's like if I, if, it's like me picking up a book and just turning to the last two chapters of a 15 page book. In the story of redemption that we looked at, I mean, that we've talked about in terms of eschatology and eternity past and eternity future, in, in that whole line of whatever God is doing, Jesus is kind of right here. He's not at the beginning. Wouldn't it have been nice if after Adam had sinned, that God sent his son and that was and, and, and so everybody could be saved, but that's not what happened at all. Because there was a problem that was created and God had to God was going to solve that problem because we couldn't do it he's going to tell it show us in the first 11 chapters of Genesis that everything that man tried didn't work and so God finally said well I'm going to I'll take care of it I'll do it so when that happens when you just read the last two chapters of the book there's so much that you miss you miss who the characters are you you miss what they did you don't really know what the plot was you don't know why it ends the way that it ends so well, why did it end that way because you don't know the, the story so if I just go up to somebody and I just said hey Jesus saves I'm kind of being a little facetious about this but if I just go up and say well Jesus saves then in reality they probably don't have a clue what I'm actually mean. Well, why do I need to be saved? Well, what is sin? You know what he means? Somebody died on the cross. It just doesn't mean much to them. And so the best thing to know is just to read the whole book, right? Just to, I want you to think with me for a moment. I want you to think about what the apostles did when they evangelized the apostles, Peter, John, Mark, all those guys that were apostles. If the audience was Jewish, right, we're going to talk about a Jewish audience and a Gentile audience. If the audience was Jewish, then that made it easy for them to evangelize. Why? Somebody tell me why. They already knew the beginning. That's right. They knew the whole story. <laughs> They knew about Genesis. They knew about the law. They knew about the coming Messiah. They knew about all of that. I mean, they had the story. They, 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 you know, they would read it. So in their case, I mean, they knew about sin. They knew about atonement. They knew about sacrifice. They knew about all of those words. It meant a lot to them. They had a priesthood. They had a temple. They had a place of worship. So all that the apostles did when they actually spoke to their Jewish audience was to try and convince them from the Old Testament that Jesus was the Messiah. Isn't that what Jesus did when he was walking on the road to Emmaus? He didn't have a New Testament. He just, he just opened the scriptures and proved that Christ was the Messiah and those guys, they were just kind of left dumbfounded. So that's what they did when they evangelized. But if the audience were Gentiles, then they took a completely different approach. I want to give you an example of that. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. So in essence, if they, when they were talking to the Gentile audience, they knew that the Gentile audience did not have any significant knowledge about God, about the Old Testament, about what it meant. And so what did they have to do? They had to give them that knowledge. Now, if you go through the book of Acts and you read about Peter, he is the apostle to the Jews. So he doesn't spend a lot of time trying to rehearse the creation story or to rehearse what 
what the Old Testament said. He just tried to prove. He did that on the day of Pentecost, right? Everybody understand what Jesus, what Paul, Peter did on the day of Pentecost? He stood up and he rehearsed the story of God from creation to where they were. And at the end, people said, well, what do I have to do to be saved? And 3,000 people repented of their sins on that day. So this Jesus whom you have crucified, he proved that the Christ was the Son of God and that they had crucified him. And they were brought to conviction and they were saved. So the apostles had to find a different starting point if the idea that Jesus saves was going to be meaningful to the Gentiles. So notice what, how Paul approached the Gentiles in Acts chapter 14. I'm going to say, I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to make an assumption that there's more that he said than what's here. All right, I'm just going to make that assumption. You don't have to agree with that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. But he's having a discussion with people. He's having a debate. He's having dialogue. He's having recourse with people, I mean discourse with people that he knew did not, were not saved and probably did not even agree with him. And he says in verse 14, chapter, 15, chapter 14, verse 15, he says, And saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things. They had all these idols that they worshipped and all that kind of stuff. And he says, he says uh, that you should turn from these useless things to the living God. Now, notice the next couple of phrases. Who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. Where did he start? He started with what? The creation. He started with the beginning. He does not start with the cross. He doesn't start with the cross. Why? Somebody tell me why. Because the cross wouldn't have made any sense to them. They don't even know that they're sinners. They, they, haven't, they haven't reached that point. They don't accept that. Then in Acts chapter 17, if you turn over there, he's at the Areopagus. It's a place where they went and, and they, uh, he told them in verse 22, he said, you're very religious. Uh, I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. In verse 23, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Okay, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I, I'm going to proclaim to you. Notice what he says. God who did what? Read it. Who made the world and everything in it. This God, this creator who made the world and everything that's in it. He made you. He made the creatures. He made the air. He made the animals. He made the trees. He made everything. This God who has made the world and everything in it, He is Lord of heaven and earth. And He does not dwell in temples made with hands. You can go and you can worship your stone and you can, you can do all of that if you want to. But this God that I'm talking about, He's not like that. Nor is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything since he gives life to all and breath and all things. In verse 29, he uses this uh, really important phrase. He says that we are the offspring of God. Okay, now everybody listen to me. I, wanna, I want you to hear my heart on this. When he told them that they were the offspring of God, what he was saying to them is that he was a personal God. He's not just some of these Athenian gods and, and all these guys that just lived up in the, up in the clouds and, and uh, they didn't mess with the normal people and they had drama and all of that. He said, this God is different. 
You are the offspring of God. You have been made in the image of God. Now, each of you had a personal relationship with your parents. Why? I didn't have much of a personal relationship with my father. He was an alcoholic. He divorced my wife. My wife. <laughs> my father didn't divorce my wife. <laughs> he divorced my mother when I was four, but they had been separated for three years. He hardly ever came home. He's out on the road all the time. And he, I, I didn't know him, but I did know my mom. And each of you had a personal relationship. Most all of us had a personal relationship with our parents. Why? Somebody tell me why. Because we are what? We are their offspring. I'm looking at Chelsea back there and she's holding Malachi. Right? That's her offspring. She has a personal relationship with him that nobody else has. He says, hey, you're the offspring of God. They had no clue what he was talking about. The principle here is self-evident that we are the result of what God has done. I look at you, I think about you, and I know that you are made in the image of God. There's something about you that's divine. You're not God. I'm not God. I'm not a little God. I'm none of that. I've just been made in the image of the divine God. And I, you can see that. You can love. You can forgive. You can help. You can show mercy. You can be kind. You can be gracious. You can help people. You can do all of those kind of things. You do that. And the cause here, I think the, the principle is very simple. The cause who is God creates us or the effect is that he creates us, right? God created me. God created you. God was the cause. I am the result. I am, I am the effect. Let me say it in a different way. I want to say it in a negative way. Maybe you think I'm stupid. It's okay. A car cannot create a dog. Right? A dog can't create a car. You have to be the same. Right? You have to be of the same essence. I can't create God. There's only one God. But I'm created by God in his image, and therefore I have a personal relationship with him. And that's why he says in verse 27, he's making this whole, this whole uh, he's communicating to them, and he says uh, uh, in verse 26, he, he, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that, notice what he says in verse 17, he's telling these people, he's evangelizing them so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. Paul says that we can know God, that we can find him, that we can know him. He's not far from any of us. I want to say something, okay? I want you. This is elementary. This is basic Christianity 101. But I want to make the point. God is not a thing. God is not something. God is a someone. He's someone that you and I can have an incredible, outstanding relationship with. The greatest relationship out of God and Christ that I have in my life is my wife. He's joined us together. I have a relationship. I have a relationship with you. I love you. I care about you. I can have a relationship. I've got grandkids here today. I've got great grandkids here today. I've got son-in-laws and daughters here today. 
And I have a relationship with each one of them. And I know that God is personable and He's knowable and we are the pinnacle of His creation. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to say this, but if God made me as fearfully and wonderfully as He did, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, right? I cannot, it's, I'm, I'm going to say this in a different way. I, I, don't, I don't mean to be preaching, just forgive me. I don't see how anybody cannot believe in God. I, I mean, I'm just, but we're in the minority. People might believe that there's a greater being, the great spirit of the universe, whatever that is, that's Buddhist. And if God made me the way that He did, then I owe Him. I owe Him the love. I owe Him the dignity. I owe Him the respect. I owe them. I owe Him the honor that only He should have. Why? It's because of everything that He has done. He created us. I think, the, I think the truth is, is that we owe God everything. I do. I want to say today just as clear as I can, I owe God everything. I owe God for breath. I owe God for life. I owe God for just being, just being able to eat and, and to have make a living. I owe everything to this great God that we're going to see what He does. created us he made us in his image and I am indebted to him he gave us a mind to think he gave us a heart to love he gave us a spirit within us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that lets us know that he is who he says that he is you and I have a moral compass you can call it your conscience whatever you want to call it you and I have a moral compass that is working in us to let us know that we are a part of the kingdom of God. For those that have ignored that reality, they only have one meaningful response. And that is to repent. That's what Peter told everybody on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 17 there, verse 30 and 31, that's what Paul says. He says, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. I remember on the night that I got saved, I gave up everything that I had been doing in my life. I gave up everything that I knew that God did not want me to do. I did it in one night, in one second. It was just, it was like, you are God, I owe you everything. I'm going to give up everything. Here's what I learned. Everybody write this down. This is one of the greatest lessons that I will ever communicate to you. God never takes anything out of your life God never takes anything out of your life without replacing it with something better. I'm glad God took drugs out of my life. I'm, God, I'm glad God took smoking out of my life. I'm glad that God took cursing out of my life. I'm glad that God took away my desire not to go to church or not to be around believers. I'm thankful that God gave me the desire to read His Word and to know Him and, and to come to Him. He says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? If you're reading the Bible and you get to a place like that, you have to ask the question, why? It's because. Anytime you see the word because, it's the answer to your question. 
because He has appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man which He has ordained, whom He has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. He's going to be there at the judgment seat of Christ. So what's the point in all of this? It's simple. What Paul did with the people who were desperately lost was not just say Jesus saves. He, he started at creation and he systematically worked his way through the big picture until he got to the cross. Now this is not a course on evangelism. Okay? Everybody understand, this is, I'm not, this is not a series on evangelism and how to evangelize people. This is a story about the big picture. If you just stay in the last two chapters of the book, you have a lot of details and information that, that need to be understood. It makes the whole... It makes the details more important when you know why they fit where they fit. There's timing involved. There's timing involved in all of this. Trust me, but the Bible is not some kind of historical fairy tale that was secretly, kind of clandestinely developed by 40 authors over 1,500 years so that they could kind of give us some kind of meaning to our life. Think of the scriptures, and I, I think this is the right word. In fact, I actually, I actually named the, the title of this message today. I, I know this is going to sound like a crazy word for you, but it's sort of like a drama. I call it the great drama. That's just the way that I think about it. It's a great drama that reveals, it reveals what God did, right? This drama that we're looking at has three parts, all right? The first part is what God did. The second part is, I'm going to just do it like this, what God is doing. And the third part is what God will do. Right? That's what this drama is about. It's about what God did. We'll learn how God did it. We'll find out what God is doing, and then we will find out what God is going to do. That's the drama. And we don't want to leave out any of the chapters if we don't have to. From Genesis 3 forward, there is this constant struggle between good and evil, between God and Satan. Between man and God, there is this constant struggle that is going on between spiritual reality and spiritual make-believe. Some of these, all this deconstruction stuff that Chris and I have been studying about. People just living in a make-believe world. They have no idea why they believe what they believe. They have absolutely no way to validate and authenticate that their ideas about God are right. They just make these things up. Listen to me. God is true to what is there. God is true to what is here. There's all kind of evidence for a worldwide flood, right? There's all kind of stories of creation before the Bible was ever written. There's all kinds of evidence in biology and science and physics and everything else that God created everything out of nothing. In the beginning, God created. So how does God validate this drama? Or this is, how does God validate this narrative, this story? Write this down. This is as important as anything I'm going to say this, this morning. How does God validate the big picture? Very simple. 
through verifiable, verifiable, not make believe, not making anything up, verifiable historical events. Verifiable historical events. I want you to think about something for me, if you will. I want to ask you a question, okay? And I want you to think about the question. The question is very important. Do you think, do you believe that there is a reason for the way that things are? Yes or no? Do you believe that there's a reason for why the world is the way that it is, for why men act the way that they do, for why they live the way that they do, do you think that there is a reason for how the world actually is? You think there's a reason for sin and moral failures that surround us at every turn? If you do not think there is a reason, hey, listen, if you and I do not think that there is a reason for any of this, we're just, we're, we're just, we're just alive and we're going to go to dust and that's going to be it. If you don't think there's a reason for the way that things are, then you cannot ask these questions. Okay? I'm going to give you the questions that everybody asks, but they shouldn't be asking them if they don't think there's a reason for it. I made a whole list of them. Why are things this way? Or why am I here? Or what am I here for? Why is anything here? I mean, why is anything here? Why is this board here? Why's why my car, my truck outside? Why is anything here? How do you make sense out of life? Does my life really matter and count? Do we just die and return to the dust? What is truth? How did I get here? These are real legitimate questions. And I'm going to tell you that the lost man doesn't have an answer to him. Let me back up. He has plenty of answers to this. He just has the wrong answers. He has no way to validate, authenticate, verify that what he thinks and what he believes is true. The only He's just living in a spiritual make-believe world. He has, no, he has no way to verify that what he believes is true. Even somebody that believes in evolution, to do that, they have to deny the laws of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics. They have to deny certain things that we know. Things don't get better, they get worse. Everything's kind of breaking down, right? They can't ask the question, is there a place called heaven? Well, hey, is there a place called hell? Do people really go there? How can I know the answers to all of these questions? Is there more to life than just eat, drink, and be merry? How will things end? Big picture. What God did, what God's doing, and what God is going to do. Very simple. Now, without seeming arrogant about all of this, my answer to all of those kind of questions, my answer, is that there are answers to each of those questions, and they're the right answers, and you can know those answers but you have to start at the beginning. You have to start at the beginning so you can see the whole story. That's why this study is what this study is about. You cannot just read the last chapter and just say, well, everybody lived happily ever after. That's not true. Wouldn't that be nice? Just write a story, write a drama, write your own book, make a novel, and in the end, Everything worked out great and everybody just just rides off into the sunset. Everybody just lives happily ever after. 
That's not true. That's not true. That's a pipe dream. It's a fairy tale. Why do I say that? It's because the Bible is an inc incredibly accurate picture of reality, of the way that things are. If you pick up the Bible and you read it honestly and sincerely, it tells you exactly what man is going to be like. It talks about sin. It talks about wars. It talks about hatred. It talks about unforgiveness. It talks about ugly things. It talks about immorality. It talks about all of that. He's not trying to hide anything in the Scriptures. God's not trying to do that. When God wrote the Bible... He never tried to hide the truth from us about the way that life is. There's this, uh, uh, I mentioned his name earlier. I have, I'm not reading any of his books right now, but I, I have re I've read all these books since, and many of the others that he wrote. But Francis Schaeffer was this great uh, theologian and apologist, and he wrote a trilogy of books. He wrote these three books together. And I want to give you the title of them. The first is that, it was called The God Who Is There. And so what he's saying in that book, what he's saying in that book is that God is here and you can validate that. And then he says, secondly, in the book, he says, he, in the second book, he says, he is there and he is not silent. So the premise of that book was that God said something so that you can know. Well, how would God say something? He would say it with words, right? He, he, just, he just happened to write it in a book that we call the Bible. And then the third book that he wrote, which I thought was one of the most amazing books that I ever read, it was called Escape from Reason. Remember what was my question to you? Do you think there's a reason that things are the way that they are? And he wrote this book about escape from reason. Why people don't use reason anymore. They just make things up. Here's what we know about life. Everybody listen to me. Life is filled with joy. It's, it's filled with love and grace and forgiveness. But it's also filled with hurt and pain. And catastrophic events that take place. The scriptures are always balanced about what life is really like. They never deny any of this. They provide God's answers and God's solutions for life. Uh, it provides God's solutions to life, for life, and during your life. I need all the help I can get. My goodness. How many of you have failed? I have failed so many times that I don't even know how to talk about it. I've made mistakes. I've hurt people. I said the wrong thing. I did this. I did that. I need to know how to live through all of that and come out on the other side in a way that would be pleasing to God. Even the current biblical... The, the picture of the current world that we live in, it's not a good picture. So if you're looking for a good picture of the world in the Bible, you're not going to find it. So I would encourage you not to really waste your time. It's going to give you an accurate picture. That's what it's going to do. Now, I want to make an observation that is critically important to this study. So please listen. I hope and pray that you will ultimately benefit from this study. When we get through, and we go through things that are important, that everything will just sort of fit in place for you. Right? If I can say it this way, we're going to put the pieces of the puzzle together so you can see what it actually looks like. I hope that will happen. I'm not sure that it actually will, but I say that because I know from personal experience that just because somebody knows the truth and somebody has heard the truth does not mean that they're going to respond to the truth. 
I can't tell you how many times I've shared the gospel with people and they not, they're not willing to respond to the truth. Just because I tell them the truth doesn't mean that they're going to respond to it. You could make the clearest gospel presentation to somebody that you could ever make, but they never even hear one word you ever communicated to them. I remember when I first got saved, we would go into bars. No, it wasn't then. It was when I moved back to Aiken. And we would go into bars and witness, and nobody listened to me. It was the wrong place. It is absolutely the wrong place to go and share the gospel. And Jesus ate with sinners and Zacchaeus came down from the tree and he's a tax collector and they went over and had a meal in his house, but it was a little bit different. Listen, for many people, what God says is the truth actually angers them. It makes them mad. It infuriates them. You can talk to them about the truth. You can just read the word of God to them. And it just infuriates them. We have so many issues in our culture. They curse God. They reject God. They blaspheme God. They hate God. We know in Revelation that even when God is pouring out His wrath on the world, that they're shaking their fist at God and blaspheming Him. And they think, unfortunately, that their little grapefruit Size brain has got everything figured out. Good luck. Good luck. So here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to know. Right now, this very moment, you have a view of God. Everybody in this room has a view of God. I don't, I'm not trying to analyze what that view is. I'm just going to tell you that everybody here in the room today has a view of God. If you were somebody that had never heard the gospel, didn't know that Jesus was a, uh, who He says He was, never seen a Bible, didn't know anything about it, you can go to China, you can go to other places in the world that people have never heard of the Bible. They don't even know the Bible exists. The government's kept it from them. You go to talking about Jesus, they wouldn't know what in the world you were talking about. I remember the first time I ever mentioned the world... The word Wally World in Romania. The guy looks at me like I'm a complete idiot, my translator. You may have the right view or it may be the wrong view, but either way you still believe something about God. Think of it this way. Either there is a God or there is not a God. Would everybody agree with that or not agree with that? Either, either there is a God or there's not a God. One of the two. You've got to kind of just get on whatever side you want to. One's the right view, one's the wrong view. Either there's a God who created you or there's not a God that created you. You just came from some cosmic slime over some explosion that happened out in the universe billions and trillions of years ago and here you are. Either God created you or you weren't created by God. You've got to get on one side. You believe something about God. Either there's a God who sent His Son to die for our sins, or there's not a God who did that. Maybe sins don't even matter anymore. you got to get on one side, right? There's no, there's no fence here that you just kind of crawl over. I believe that there is a God. I believe that my God created me, and I believe that my God sent His Son to die for my sins. I know that I'm a sinner. I don't have to read the Bible to know that. You gotta get you gotta you gotta make a decision. Right now you believe something about God, about life, you believe something about heaven, you believe something about hell, you believe what's right and what's wrong. I've got a guy that has asked me, I'm in the process of reviewing a book on universalism. I don't agree with universalism, and I'm doing it as a uh, he, he wants to use me on the back cover of the book. I'm, no, 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 no. That's not happening. Because I don't believe that what you're writing is accurate or true. It, it, not even close to what the Bible says. You've been developing your ideas about God your entire life. You've been, you went to school with certain people. You had certain friends. 
You may have gone to church, you may not have gone to church. All of that impacted what you think about God. You may have had good teachers, bad teachers. Your background impacts a lot of times what we believe. And even if you've not thought much about your view of God, you still have one. The atheist has a view about God, right? He doesn't believe that there's a God. That's his view. He's on that side, I'm on the other side. He doesn't believe that there is a God and that he just thinks that you and I are complete fools. You know, if you think, if you talk to an atheist, he's going to think that you're an absolute hypocrite and bigot. Stupid. Stupid. The Buddhists believe in a kind of very impersonal cosmic God that's in everything. Listen to this. Listen to this. They have elevated a cow to a place of deity. Francis Schaeffer would say they have escaped from reason. Well, what did, they, what, what did the nation of Israel do when God took them to Mount Sinai for the first time? What did they make? They made a cow. They had walked through and the water was up on the sides and they could see it and they saw the whole Egyptian army drown and they make a cow because for 30 days Moses wasn't with them? Does that make any sense? Everybody here has a worldview about God even if they don't know what it is. People are going to say to you if you get into a discussion with them about God, here's what they're going to say by listen. I'm going to say something and I want to say it in kind of a strong way. They're going to say to you, they're going to, they're going to say, well, you can believe what you want to believe about God and I'll believe what I want to believe about God. That is absolutely stupid. That's the most stupid thing that I could ever say to somebody. You will never, ever hear me say that. Well, you just believe what you want to and I'll believe what I want to. No! I want the dialogue to stay open. I want to talk to you. You don't have to agree with me. I still want to talk. I want to plant a seed. I'm a gardener. My wife has a cousin who married a Buddhist. And we tried to talk to her several times about Christ and about God and that's exactly what she says. He said, well, you believe what you want to believe and I believe what I want to believe. And I'm not talking about it anymore. It doesn't do any good. If you don't have dialogue, if you don't keep the dialogue open, you can't talk. You can't get to the right conclusion. Someone may say to you, I just do not see things the same way that you do. Okay, great, I don't. You don't have to believe everything that I believe. You don't have to see everything the way that I see it. Or they may say, I think you're completely confused about what you believe. It's okay. I'm not going to be offended by that. I used to feel the same exact way, right? I didn't want those guys coming down to hall knocking on the door, wanting to tell me about Jesus. I thought they were confused. I didn't think they had a clue what they were talking about. Things change. If you close the dialogue, there's no communication. All of these kinds of statements, I just don't see things the way that you do. I think you're totally confused about your faith. Their views of how people think, of what their worldview is, Everybody, listen, I'll make a, this is a stupid statement, right? Everybody believes something about everything. Everybody believes something about everything. It's a good starting point. Even if they've not really thought through it. If they can think then they believe something about something else, even if it's wrong. All right. Just because someone, anyone, me, or you, 
say that we believe something does not make what we believe right. It doesn't. Just because I say, this is because I say something doesn't make it right. Just because I say that I believe something doesn't make it right. The, the Buddhists say they believe something. The atheist says that he believes something. The communists say that they believe something. Does that make it right? Yes or no? No. No. There are plenty of people who do not believe in things that are right or godly. They think that godliness is wrong and the gospel is wrong. And the point is that just saying you believe something does not really have any credibility if you do not have any verifiable evidence to support what you believe. So what did I tell you that God was going to give to us? Somebody tell me. Verifiable historical events. I'll say it again. Verifiable historical events. Here's what God's going to do. Everybody look up here for just a minute and I'll be closed. God's going to say, I will. That's what He's going to say. He's going to say, I will. I will do something. He tells Abraham, the first one that we're going to see is in Genesis chapter 12. You can go home and read it. First time, God says, I will. He says, Abraham, I will make a great and mighty nation out of you. That's what He says He's going to do. And then we just watch that take place. Verifiable. Historical. Events. And we watch it take place. I want to close with perspective. We started with perspective, right? Everybody said right. That's your cue. <laughs> That's your cue. We started with talking about perspective. I'm going to erase all this or I'll just do it this way. I want to draw you a picture it won't take me just a second This is a person. It might not look like one, okay? No laughing. This is Joseph. Everybody know the story of Joseph? His brothers took him and they threw him where? Into a pit. He cannot get out. Wild animals are going to come, fall in the pit, he's going to die. Right? That was Joseph's what? Somebody tell me. That was his perspective. If I was down in that pit, if I'd fallen into a well and nobody knew where I was and my cell phone was off and they couldn't find me, I would think I'm not going to make it to the top. I'm done. And then there were the brothers. I'm just drawing several of them. And here are the brothers. And what they didn't see, I'm going to draw a camel, okay? That doesn't look like a camel, does it? Yeah. They're camels, and this is a caravan. And so they get a different perspective, right? What was their perspective? Somebody tell me, what was now their perspective? They left him there to die. They saw the caravan just by chance, Providence, Providio. They said, hey. That's right. They felt kind of guilty that they had put him in there to begin with. So what did God use? God used his their greed. He said, I'll use their greed. We'll sell him and he'll be okay. Then there's Potiphar. They sell him to Potiphar. Potiphar's got a house. He's got a wife. Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife accuses him of something and they send him to jail. I'm, that's, that's jail. 
Poor old Joseph. He'd been in the pit. He got falsely accused. He's now in jail. What kind of what kind of perspective do you think that Joseph had at that point? I'm never going to get out of jail. I'm never going to get out of jail. Perspective is everything. I want to say something to you. You ought to write this down if you take notes. Your perspective ought to always be anchored in God. God. Knew everything that was going to happen. God knew everything. This is called providence. Where God saw what was going to happen and provided a means to get Joseph out of the pit, to get him into Potiphar's house who saw a man of worth in him. He got taken to jail. The jailer saw a man of worth in him. What did he have in jail? He had a dream. Where did the dream come? I mean, uh, the butler and the baker, they had dreams, right? Where did the dreams come from? Who gave them the dreams? God gave them the dreams. They didn't, this wasn't the, they weren't thinking about seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. God gave them a dream. So far during this whole study, who's in charge? Somebody tell me. God's in charge. The Pharaoh had that dream. Whoever had it. The, the, the butler and the baker had <laughs> dreams and he... No, you're right. Pharaoh had the dream. I'm sorry. That's okay. Stupid right here. <laughs> Stupid right there. I, I'll write that here. Somebody come up here and give me a tattoo. No, it's called Vietnam. It no, no, it, it's called stupid. I mean, I knew that. And so the butler and the baker, they have the dreams. One of them dies. And then we have Pharaoh. I'm just going to do it this way. He is... He is the Pharaoh over all of the earth. And the next day... Joseph is second. We're not through. What happened to Joseph? He brought his, he brought his family. Seventy of them. They came. They went to Goshen. What happened in Goshen? What did they do? They multiplied. They went from 70 to probably two and a half to three million. <clears throat> Abraham is way back here. Right? Abraham is way back here, and God says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to make a great and mighty nation out of you. If you, if you go out somewhere, if I go out to eat today and some guy comes walking into the restaurant, I'm not going to look at Larry and Bonnie and Chris and Tracy or my wife or somebody and say, well, there goes a great and mighty nation. And the worst part is that wife couldn't have any kids, and then his next son couldn't have any kids. And we get down here, I'm just going to say we've got three million people. And God's got a nation. See, Joseph, Joseph went through the trials. He went through everything that was difficult. But God had a plan. And it involved Joseph. And it involved Potiphar. And it involved Pharaoh. And it in involved going to Goshen. God had a bigger plan. This is the perspective that I want right here.
forgive me. I have stage four cancer. I have stage four cancer twice. I just had open heart surgery. I have headaches every day. God has a plan for my life. And I'm not afraid to go through the trials so that he can get me where he wants me to be. You know what God's doing? God's changing my life. I feel like I'm drinking living water out of a fire hose. Every day I sit down to study, I read the Bible in the morning, and I just like, the other day I try to read six, seven chapters a day. The other day I got through the first eight verses of Romans chapter one. I couldn't stop writing. I had a whole other sermon today. A completely different sermon than what I've got here for you. On Friday afternoon, God says, I want you to change it. I'm just drinking out of a fire hose. This is the richest time of my life ever. And I'm going through the worst trial of my life. I have a wife to think about. I have a church family to think about. I have friends to think about. And I'm going through the worst trial of my life. I feel bad every day. And I am so grateful that I have God's perspective on my life. I'm not preaching at you, trust me. I'm preaching for you. Because none of us are exempt from the trials that life is going to bring us. I just want to come out on the other side. Like Chris's aunt, or whoever. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Any questions or comments?